Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. I want to apologize if I uh, don't remember something or, or if I'm a little slower than I usual. I came down with a flu last night, so not feeling that great. But um, regardless, it's wonderful to be with you today. Um, today we're going to um, study the person of Nehemiah. We have started last time I was here a four-week series on leadership. And today we're going to study the person of Nehemiah. It is a story about a man that saw a need, rose up, captured a vision, laid out a plan and mobilized others to join him in his cause. In fact, one of the really distinct uniqueness about the story of Nehemiah is that there was no miracle that occurred in this book, even though incredible things were accomplished. There was no real miracles that occurred in this book. Nobody healed and nobody was raised from the dead, and God simply answered prayers by providing a leader with favors, strength, wisdom, and poured his blessing upon him. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never studied the book of Nehemiah. Actually, I don't even think I've heard a sermon ever on Nehemiah. You know, when I began to kind of do some research on great leaders in the Bible, Nehemiah keep popping up, and I was intrigued. And as I began to study the book of Nehemiah, I was just blown away by the fact that I believe it is the best book in the entire Bible on the subject of leadership. In this story, it shows you how to discern a vision for your life and work, how to communicate that vision, how to recruit a team, how to communicate persuasively, how to ask for things, how to overcome difficulties in the midst of opposition. These are all leadership principles that was displayed in the life of Nehemiah. While someone might say, well, it doesn't really apply to me. I'm really not a leader. Well, let me tell you this. Yes, you are. As you remember from our last time together, Leadership is defined not about a title, not about a position. It is not about temporary achievement, the color of your skin or the tribe you belong to. True leadership cannot be won over, appointed, or assigned. Leadership is simply about influence. About influence. You see, the moment you decided to follow Jesus... You became a person of influence. From that point on, people are watching you and me. How we act, how we speak, our character, and how we behave. They want to see what difference Jesus has made in our lives. This is how the early church grew. In the first 300 years after the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, Christianity grew exponentially around the known world without ever starting a war or any violence. Because people saw how Christians lived differently and we changed the world by the way we lived our lives. In your family, your place of work, in your community, you are a person of influence. You are a person of influence for the kingdom of God. When you are in Christ, you are a new creature. Old things have passed, and the new you have come. This morning, we will focus on the first 11 verses 
of the chapter one of the book of Nehemiah. <clears throat> but I'd like to give you a quick recap of the story. In about 1,000 BC, 1,000 BC, King David established the city of Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish people, fulfilling a promise that was made by God. Under King David, a wall was built around the city of Jerusalem for its own protection from invaders, and the city flourished and grew. King David's son, King Solomon, was responsible for the construction of the holy temple. All right, we're good so far? A little bit of background. However, the Jewish people fell into sin. They erected false idols, and it angered God. God became angry. So in 586 B.C., the Babylonians captured the city of Jerusalem, completely destroying the city, burned the temple, tore down the wall, and has taken most of his people into captivity in Babylon, which is the modern day, anybody know? Iraq. Babylon is the modern day Iraq. So, <clears throat> fast forward, 140 years as many kingdoms come and many kingdoms go at the time Babylon was no longer the dominant kingdom the new power now rests in Persia Persia is the modern day Iran right Persia is the modern day Iran Nehemiah was a Jew that works as a cupbearer of the Persian king. Now, a cupbearer is someone who holds the responsibility of serving and tasting the beverages, let's just be honest, wine for the king. The role of the cupbearer was significant in ancient times. They were entrusted in ensuring the safety and quality of the drinks consumed by the king. So if the drink was poison, who dies first? The cupbearer, right? So how important that role was. So they would taste the wine and other drinks before they presented to the king to make sure they were not poisoned or tampered with. So the cupbearer had the trust of the king and often had close access to the king allowing them to influence the king and also advise the king. So, again, the cupbearer was an important role, right, in, to the king. All right, so that's a little bit of background on the story. So as we begin to talk about influence, how do we begin to live a life of influence? As we see it in the person of Nehemiah, it begins in the heart. It all starts from the heart. In anything in life, it is hard to be successful in anything if your heart is not in it. I'm so glad my sister is here with us today because she will be the only one who can testify to the story that I'm about to tell. I was a violinist when I was a child. Really, I played the violin. I don't know, remember how, when I started, probably about the age five, something like that. And according to my mother, I was actually pretty good. I played in a, um, a uh, orchestra in, in Taiwan, children's orchestra, right? I'm not lying, right? She's, right? So, so Joanne always thinks I'm making things up. Just, you know, I'm not making it up right now. I, I was really good at it. And, um, However, I hated playing the violin. My sister used to take me to lessons and I would cry. My dad will take me, I will cry. My mom will take me, I will cry. When I go to lessons, I will cry. When I practice at home, I will cry. I was a big baby, I hated to play the violin. My heart 
was, fi was just not in it. So after several years, finally one day, as I was practicing and crying at the same time, just imagine me crying and playing the violin at the same time, my mom said, Bebe, that was my name in Chinese, if you don't stop crying, then <laughs> we need to do something, okay? So she was trying to make a deal with me, basically. So whatever she was saying, it was like music to my ears. So being a seven, eight-year-old, I was like, okay, I was listening. Okay, mom, let's make a deal. So um, I proceeded to make a deal with my mom. And I say, mom, I promise, if you let me stop playing the violin, I promise you, I will be the best student in school. My mom thought about it and uh, basically said, okay. So I stopped playing the violin. I was so happy. Well, looking back, I think Vaughn was here. She will say that she probably made a terrible deal because we all knew how I was a student in school. I was terrible. I was a terrible student in school. Now today, as I look back, I wish the lessons didn't stop. And I wish I still played the violin. I regret it for not applying myself at that time. However, it is difficult to be good at anything and continue anything if your heart is not in it. It's a life lesson that has carried me all of my life and I often share that with my children. I believe today that the Holy Spirit wants to give each and every one of us a new heart for what he has placed in our lives, a new passion. This is what happened to Nehemiah. Nehemiah hears from those who came from Jerusalem, telling them, help telling him about the state of the city and the destruction of the wall and his suffering people. And the Holy Spirit moves in Nehemiah's heart, although at this point in his life, Nehemiah has never even been to Jerusalem. Let's take a look at verse 4. So now it came when I heard these words. I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. The news touched his heart so deeply, he wept and he mourned. Brothers and sisters, why don't we ask God today to give us a heart for where he has us and the people that he has in our lives? Ask God to give us a new heart to see them as he sees them, to enable us to feel as he feels. The word passion comes from the word compassion. Without compassion, it is difficult to lead anything. In Proverbs 13, 12, it says, Hope defer makes the heart sick. Hope defer makes the the heart sick. Have you ever been promised something, hoped for something, dreamt of something, only to realize that it was not fulfilled? It hurts, doesn't it? This is Nehemiah's experience. He was well aware of the warnings given from Moses and the prophet Jeremiah that if his people disobey God, which they did, God will scatter them into exile, which they are. He was also fully aware of the promise of God through Jeremiah and the prophet Isaiah that if they turn back to God, that God will regather them in Jerusalem and bless them. But this has not happened. The city of Jerusalem still lays in ruins. Hope defer makes the heart sick. 
This is the pain that Nehemiah felt when he wept. Similarly, I believe we live in a world today as Christians, you know, we're not physically sick or like a cold or flu or disease of some kind, but rather we are sick in the heart. Hope defer makes the heart sick. We struggle with challenges of this world. There are many things, right? Economy, wars and rumors of wars, leader that fail us, the rise in anti-religion and the glorification of sin. We often as Christians feel hopeless. We feel that we do not have the authority or even the power to make a difference. So we close our hearts and hope is snuffed out. It is a terrible way to live. The prophet, the prophet Ezekiel, who prophesied during the time of the exiles of the Jews, said God promised something. By his spirit, God will remove us, move from us the heart of stone and give us a new heart, a heart filled with hope. As God's people, we are meant to be people with soft hearts and hard feet. What does that mean? We are meant to have hearts of compassion and with feet hard enough to walk into challenges of our calling. Soft hearts and hard feet. But so often we end up as people with hard hearts and soft feet Basically, feeling nothing and going nowhere. Brothers and sisters, let the Holy Spirit in again in your heart. Let God perform heart surgery on us. And as he does, hope will arise. Passion will be rekindled. And vision will be recast. Christianity is not about behavior modification, but rather it is about heart transformation. Like Nehemiah, let us start with our heart and become people of influence. The second point is that we become people of influence through prayer. Through prayer. When Nehemiah heard about the troubles in Jerusalem, the first things he did was pray. We read verse 4, and then verse 5, he says, And I say, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heavens, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenants and the loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive to thine eyes, open to hear the prayers of your servant, which I am praying before you. Now day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel. The very first thing that Nehemiah did when he heard of the troubles of Jerusalem, he prayed. In the book of Nehemiah, there are nine occasions, nine occasions when he prayed. In his first prayer, he began by acknowledging who God is. He acknowledged that God is great. He acknowledged that God is in control. If you ever wonder what is the most eloquent expression of our priorities, it is in our prayer. If you ever wonder what is the most important thing in someone's life, you can find out the answer by simply asking, what do you pray about most often? Prosperity? Pleasure, comfort, rationalizing sin. You see, prayer is the expression of our priorities. Prayer is also a reflection of our character. Christians has always prayed prayers of hope and faith. 
Because we believe that when we pray in faith and in hope, things happen around us. God listens to our prayers and we can begin to influence the world around us. Theologian Karl Barth once said this, to clasp the hand in prayer, it is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of this world. What he is saying is that to pray from the depth of your heart, which is the way to influence the world around us. Third point, to be a leader of influence, we must learn to confess. We must learn to confess. In Nehemiah 2, verse 6, Nehemiah says, I confess the sin of the Israelites, including myself and family, has committed against you. You see, it's easy to blame the exile on the previous generation, which happened literally 140 years before Jeremiah. But here, Jeremiah takes personal and spiritual responsibility that he prayed, including myself and my family. You see, confession is one of the most wonderful things that we can do as believers. That when we confess to our Father in heaven, we begin to experience the intimate embrace of his love and grace and understand the power of God's forgiveness. Point number four is to be a person of influence. Do not forget to remember. Do not forget to remember. In verses eight and nine, he remembers instructions that were given by Moses to the people. That if you obey my commandments, that God will regather them back in Jerusalem and bless them. You see, when we remember all the Lord has done in our lives and remember all the promises he has made to us, it results in us a fresh and compelling vision of what he will do in the future. That is why in the scriptures, the Bible commands us to remember over 166 times. In the scripture, 166 times, the Bible commands us to remember. We are to remember not just what God has done in our lives, but we are to remember what he has done and what he has promised to his people throughout the history of the Bible. That is what exactly Nehemiah did. He remembered his prayers, the promises God has made through the prophet Isaiah. In his prayer, Nehemiah said this. He says, God, I remember you said to Isaiah that you promised to regather us in Jerusalem. In another word, Nehemiah takes the promise back to the one that made the promise in his prayer. That we ought to do the same. He understands that our God is multi-generational. Some promises he gives us to temporarily store until we pass it on to the next generation. Think of Abraham. God promised Abraham to be the father of many nations. Through him, all people will be blessed. How many remember the old Sunday school song, Father Abraham? Father Abraham, he had many sons. Something like that, right? Remember that? Many sons. We ever stop to think about that? I don't think any of us ever stop to think about the words of that song. When Abraham died, how many sons did he have? One. Isaac. He didn't have many sons. He had one. But the promise 
to Abraham is fulfilled through Isaac and Jacob and so on and so on, that Abraham indeed became the father of all the nations and all of us here are the continuation and the fulfillment of that promise. God's promise is multi-generational. When Nehemiah finally went to Jerusalem, he is to build the wall that has been destroyed by the Babylonians and to reform the communities there. Nehemiah went there with the prophet Ezra. They gather the people in the middle of the city, and what do they do? They gather them in the city for a public reading of the scriptures. They read from the laws of Moses to remind the people the promises God has made to them. This is what happens when we read God's word and recall his promises to us. Because we begin to count the blessings and not the cost of our calling. Let me say that again. Because we begin to count the blessings and not the cost of our calling. Nehemiah's call to go to Jerusalem came with a cost. You see, he was the cupbearer to the king. He had the best job in the world. He served the most powerful man in the world. He lived in a palace. He was comfortable. It was nice. But Nehemiah chose to leave the security and comfort in his best job in the world to go to Jerusalem, to a fallen city, to regather the people, to rebuild the wall. He faced opposition, both internal and external. What did Nehemiah say? Not woe is me. He hold on to the blessings God has promised him and his people. You see, when we forsake our own selfish desires, there is power in God's promise for your life and in my life. If there's one thing I hope you take away from this message today, is that to lay hold of God's promises and let them lay hold of you. To lay hold of God's promises and let them lay hold of you. It will radically transform your life. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I came so they might have life and might have it abundantly. Claim the promises of God. Lay hold of them today and let the promise of God lay hold of you. In 2001, Apple, as a strictly computer company, was struggling. With declining sales and lack of innovation products in its lineup, I know it's interesting, it's funny to hear that, right? But that was really true at that time. Lack of innovative products in its lineup. Their computer at the time was considered too futuristic, unlike the more practical PC powered by the Microsoft software. Recognizing the need for a game changer, Steve Jobs, who was the co-founder and CEO of Apple at the time, envisioned a portable music player that will disrupt the market and change the way people listen to music. However, Steve Jobs understood that the timing had to be perfect for such product to be successful. He waited patiently until the technology advanced to a point where a small, sleek, and user-friendly device could be created to store and play music, replacing the what? The CD, right? But the consumer also had to be ready for this new way of playing music. In a small handheld device versus which dominated the market at the time 
which was the Sony Walkman, which played a single CD. In 2001, Apple released the iPod, a portable media player that quickly gained popularity and became a cultural phenomenon. By waiting for the right moment to introduce the iPod, Steve Jobs tapped into a growing demand for digital music and positioned Apple as a leader in the industry. The timing of iPod's release combined with an innovative design and seamless integration with iTunes propel Apple's success and set the stage for future groundbreaking products such as the iPhone in 2007 and the iPad in 2010. Steve Jobs' ability to understand timing, market trends, anticipating consumer needs, and wait for the right moment to introduce these products exemplifies the power of timing in leadership. The story of Steve Jobs and Apple serves as a reminder of the importance of timing for a leader. This leads to our fifth point because every good leader understands timing. Understands timing. No matter how large the challenges that you are facing, a leader understands that our God is bigger. Let's take a look at verse 11. O oh Lord, I beseech thee, attend to my prayers, O oh God, servant, and the prayer of thy servant, who delight to reverse, uh, revere thy name and make thy servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now, I was the cupbearer to the king. You see, in order to be granted permission to leave the palace of the king and return to Jerusalem, Nehemiah must first get the king's approval. King Arxerxes was the king of Persia. He was the most powerful man on earth at the time. A good leader understands that timing is everything. Nehemiah waited for the right moment to speak to the king about returning to Jerusalem. It took him almost four months, four months after he first heard about the ruined walls. Why? Well, like any good leaders, Nehemiah was taking his time to formulate a plan and a strategy. In chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, I'm not going to read it right now, but he goes to the king, Arceus, and asks him for permission to go back to Jerusalem to build the wall. Not only did the king grant him his request, but he also granted the request for Nehemiah to have authority to pass through freely in the region and to harvest timber to rebuilding of the gates, the city wall, and the temple. Even more, the king sends his own army along with Nehemiah to protect him and to help him. A good leader of influence is someone who understands timing. Our last point today is that our leader is someone that navigates. It is the idea that anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a leader to chart the course. Arthur Leroy Ames once said this, a leader is one who sees more than others see, who sees farther than others see, and who sees before others see. Leaders who navigate not only control the direction in which they travel, they see a plan in their head, they have a vision, and the destination is clear. Most importantly, they understand what it will take to get there 
and know who they will need on the team in order to be successful. In this story of Nehemiah, he could see both the problem and the solution, even though he has never even stepped foot in Jerusalem. Nehemiah saw more than other seas. He knew that the wall could and should be rebuilt, and he knew what it was going to take to do it. Once he arrived in Jerusalem, Nehemiah assessed the situation firsthand and had a full understanding of the challenges that he was facing and began to put a plan together. He met with the people and cast the vision. He gave people confidence and a certain authority from God and the permission granted to him by the king. He gave buy-in from the people by appealing to their sense of dignity, identity, and responsibility in chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. He then organized the people logically in the right positions and gave and got them started working. And eventually they completed the rebuilding of the walls in just 52 days. It's amazing. So how does our story end? Once the work was finished, Nehemiah stayed in Jerusalem as the governor of Judah for 12 years. And after 12 years, he chose to return to Persia and to the king Artaxerxes. But he recognized that he must appoint and equip others to lead the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Nehemiah was not satisfied with a one-time victory. That he understand, like any good leaders, in order for the work to go on, that he had to empower others to lead. He had to give his power away. And once he had the right people in place, he felt his work was done and returned to the king as he had promised. As we draw this story of leadership to a close, what do we learn today? Number one, leadership is about influence. Number two, leadership begins with the heart. Number three, leadership understands the power of prayer. Number four, leadership surrenders self through confession. Leadership remembers the promises and the goodnesses of God. A good leader understands the strategy of timing. And finally, a good leader is one that has a plan and navigates that plan. In the book of Revelations, Jerusalem represents the church, the body of Christ. Reminds us that all of God's promises finds their yes in Jesus. That Jesus is the fulfiller and the fulfillment of every promise. Jesus is a reason for our hope, the source of our strength, and the foundation of our faith. It is in Jesus that we find redemption, salvation, and eternal life. Like Nehemiah, may we be encouraged to live in the hope of his promise, knowing that he is faithful to fulfill every word that's ever been spoken. Let us as believers to look towards the future with confidence in Jesus, that he has made all things possible. And may we continue to walk in faith, trusting him, to fulfill his promise in our lives. Let us pray. Father God, indeed, you are good. You are so good to us. We claim your promise this morning that as your people, as we faithfully walk with you, 
that you will bless us, that you will bless this church as we come together with one heart united in one purpose. We commit ourselves to you, this church, our family. Father, use us for your glory that you above all may be glorified in all that we say and do. Amen.